I'd like to begin by getting your quick impression on something. What is the very first image that comes to your mind when you think about fighting climate change? Is it perhaps a windmill or a solar array or perhaps a tropical rainforest? Well, these are the kinds of images that you may see in a magazine or on television put forward by companies trying to impress you with their green credentials. And they're all very important. These images in the climate action field are associated with a set of measures referred to as climate mitigation. That is, they're setting out to address the root causes of climate change by either by reducing the heat trapping greenhouse gases that are causing global warming or by removing carbon from the atmosphere, such as through protecting forests. But there's another set of, of climate actions and measures with a different set of images. Those might include the uh, actions by a farmer shifting from current crops to those that are more drought tolerant, or by the city of Miami having installed pumps under its streets to keep the sea at bay, or by Venice's famous sea barrier, or in Pakistan following a recent devastating flood where they've decided along the Indus River to reopen traditional wetlands to serve as flood retention basins. These measures are referred to in the climate action field as climate change adaptation. So these are the two measures that we have. Adaptation, which is about reducing the vulnerability of people, infrastructure, and ecosystems to the impacts of climate change, and mitigation, addressing the root causes. Now let me do one more quick quiz. Which do you think between these two sets of measures receives the most funding, perhaps the, the highest percentage of international and, and domestic climate change financing. Those of you who think it's roughly split, perhaps, raise your hands. Those who think climate adaptation is getting more funding. All right, and those who think climate change mitigation is getting the bulk of the funding. Well, those who chose mitigation were correct. In fact, approximately 90% of current climate funding goes to climate mitigation actions, leaving 10% or less for climate adaptation. And within that 10%, Less than 5% is coming from the private sector. So climate adaptation financing is primarily a public sector undertaking at present. What's wrong with that? Well, it's a matter of balance and prudence given our changing circumstances. We have just been through the warmest summer on record and it's very likely that this year will be the hottest ever experienced in human history. But there's another way of thinking about that. It's quite likely also that this year will be one of the coolest that we will experience for the rest of our lives. Now, I have spent most of my career trying to help improve environmental policies mostly in the Asia and Pacific region. And when I shifted some years ago to really focusing more on climate change adaptation, the science at that time did not lead me to believe that I would live to actually witness the beginning of the shift of our planet's climate. Yet. Here we are, 
Take wildfires, for example. The number of Canadians and Americans exposed to wildfire risk has more than doubled in just the last 20 years. And the costs of climate-related disasters, even taking account of population increase and inflation and poor land use planning, is rising rapidly. It's currently between 150 and 200 billion US dollars per year, which is twice the value of the total international climate-related assistance provided to developing countries. This is not just about infrastructure. The World Health Organization has declared climate change to be the single biggest threat in the health sector affecting humanity. And climate change is also an important driver of ecosystem degradation and biodiversity loss. Yet, we are grossly underinvesting in climate change adaptation. Why is this? Well, I think one of the reasons may be that the mindset of decision makers, particularly in the West, was strongly influenced by Al Gore's seminal film, An Inconvenient Truth. Now, those of you who've seen that may recall that the potential for climate breakdown was an important part of the story. But the main message was about the root causes of climate change and about the urgent need for mitigation actions to wean us off of the burning of fossil fuels. So we need to wake up and begin taking action. Our planet has already warmed by 1.2 degrees centigrade since the start of the Industrial Revolution. And even if we are able to somehow get ourselves on track to stay beneath the danger threshold established by the international scientific community of 1.5 degrees warming. There's so much heat, heating already cooked into our atmosphere and our oceans that the planet's temperature is not expected to stabilize before the end of this century. That's right. None of us can realistically expect to live to see global warming actually stop. Now, that's because our atmosphere has been fundamentally changed. The chemistry has been altered. And we are now living in an entirely new climate regime, one that has never been experienced in the history of human civilization. Now, that's a lot to take in. I deal with these issues almost every day, and I find it a bit overwhelming. But we need to begin to step up to deal with this reality. And I'd like to put forward four types of positive actions to begin this action, to begin this work. Now, we know we can do a better job of educating our decision makers, and the general public about this new inconvenient truth. And our economies need to be prepared to deal with these rapidly rising costs of climate change disasters, with disruptions to business supply chains, and especially to pressures on income inequality derived from the fact that the poor tend to suffer earliest and worst from climate change impacts. Our societies also need to be prepared to cope with potentially huge dislocations of people, with some 200 million climate migrants predicted to be on the move from uninhabitable areas by the year 2050. 
Second, we need to focus at the local level in terms of understanding the risks and in preparing appropriate responses. Each community needs to develop its own understanding of the risks that it faces, and it needs to do that based on a scientifically sound analysis and using site-specific information. We need to begin to, and they also need to, to be directly involved in developing the appropriate responses. Now, that's going to require a set of institutions to support them in these areas, and we need to build out that capacity rapidly. You, too, can help. I often get asked, what can I do to, to uh, support action on climate change? And apart from reducing your carbon footprint, climate change adaptation measures are a relatively inexpensive and personally beneficial type of action. Get to know the risks where you live. Develop an emergency plan. Take measures to other measures to reduce your risk. And all the while, advocate for climate change adaptation measures in your community. Third, we need supportive government policies. In short, we need to stop planning for the way things have been and begin preparing for the way things are. This will not be easy because the past is no longer a good predictor of the future. Take the concept of a 100-year rainfall event. If it's based on past observations, it actually doesn't have very much meaning now. Building codes, land use plans, hazard maps for storm surge or for wildfires all need to be recalibrated and all over the world. And this needs to be done through a dynamic rather than a static mindset that will increasingly rely on sophisticated computer modeling, and even artificial intelligence to project what is likely to occur consistent with our understanding of our changing climate. Let's do away with some of these existing policies that makes this job harder, like incentives to develop in areas that are clearly climate risky. Finally, we need to increase climate adaptation funding, as I mentioned. And that's going to hinge heavily on our ability to blend together public and private financing. Now, some insurance companies have started to offer uh, incentives for their customers to take steps to reduce their climate risks. That's encouraging. At the same time, we see other insurance companies running away from climate liabilities. But leaders amongst the insurance industry recognize that there's an increased demand for their expertise and services, and they're beginning to step up and take key roles. This blending of public and private financing requires innovative thinking. And we need to find ways to crowd in private sector financing through careful use of public resources. That will need to take account of the fact that many of the benefits that will come from climate adaptation investments will not be from traditional improvements in efficiency, but rather from reducing or avoiding future costs. A recent survey done by a fund set up specifically to catalyze climate resilience investments identified some encouraging news. It showed that entrepreneurs, particularly young ones, are enthusiastic about developing 
profitable business models and startups specifically designed to address climate vulnerabilities and reduce them. The fourth area is action at the global level. And that needs to begin by establishing a goal, a set of goals around climate adaptation, similar to those that we've already established at the global level for climate change mitigation. Fortunately, this is on the agenda for this year's climate summit, COP28, which will be held in Dubai. An increasing number of developing countries have prepared national adaptation plans. And the G7 has pledged to double its financing to provide support to those countries for their implementation. The G20 is working to reform the World Bank and other international financial institutions so that they can greatly increase their investment around climate change with special attention to climate change adaptation. And it's time we addressed the international legal aspects of the concept of climate refugees or climate migrants so that we can begin to prepare to deal with the plight of these displaced people and the associated political repercussions. Now, I recognize that this is a very ambitious agenda, but we now face a new reality. Climate change is upon us. We need to elevate attention to climate change adaptation to the same level that is, that is given to climate change mitigation. The international community mobilized some 10 trillion US dollars in response to the COVID pandemic. And it's reasonable to expect that eventually a similar global response will emerge for this existential threat. Meanwhile, we need to buy time. We need to hold together our economies and our societies as we make the difficult transition to a net zero and climate resilient world. We know what to do and we're all in this together, so let's get to it. <laughs>